And now it's my distinct privilege to welcome our speaker for this evening, Reverend Ronald Roberson. Father Ronald, as we heard, is the Associate Director of the Secretariat for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in Washington, D.C. He completed his doctoral degree at the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome and has served on the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. Among his writings, one with which many of us are familiar is the extremely valuable chronicle he does of the Eastern Churches, which he edits and in which he offers detailed information on documents and meetings and declarations and important gatherings and happenings and events in all the various churches of the Christian East. In light of all these events, his lecture this evening on Catholic Orthodox relations, hopes for the future, will point us forward to the vision and the hopes that are dear to the hearts of all of us who are gathered here tonight. We look forward, Father Ron, to an inviting and stimulating and thought-provoking lecture this evening. So please join me in warmly welcoming Father Ronald Roberson. Christ is risen. Christos unviat. Okay. I'm glad to know there's some Romanians present. <laughs> you may have noticed in the uh, little brochure here that I, my doctoral dissertation was on contemporary Romanian Orthodox ecclesiology. So some years ago, learned Romanian and spent some time in that country, which was a very fascinating experience for me. So uh, very happy to know that there is some presence of that tradition here this evening. It's really a great honor for me to be invited to give this lecture this year, and I'm very grateful for the invitation. And I also know that here in the Pittsburgh area, there's a fairly large concentration of Eastern Christians of various traditions, and so the subject of Orthodox Catholic relations is probably of greater interest than it would be in other places. So what I'd like to do today is to look at the whole Christian East basically from a Catholic perspective, um, and the relationships that we have with the three basic groups that are out there, not only the Orthodox Church, often called Eastern Orthodox for the sake of, uh, of uh, shorthand and a sense to distinguish them from another group, the Oriental Orthodox Churches, and also the Assyrian Church of the East. So essentially, I'd like to take each of those and take a look at them, kind of see some of the history where those relationships stand at the present time. And um, I think that in just about every case, there's good reason to be hopeful about the future of these relationships, because as we'll see, in many cases, they've gone through some very difficult periods, but uh, the major dialogues, I think, are now very much on track, and that there is good reason to be hopeful about the future of those relationships. You know, I always have to kind of roll my eyes when I hear people talk about the undivided church of the first millennium, because the fact is the church was not undivided in the first millennium. In fact, the first major divisions in the Christian world that still exist today originated only halfway through the first millennium in the fifth century controversies about the person of Jesus Christ. And one of the churches that derive from those divisions is the so-called Nestorian Church. It grew up in ancient Mesopotamia, its origins go back probably at least to the third century, and flourished for centuries within the Persian Empire and in other parts of Asia as far away as Tibet, China, and even Mongolia. This church accepted the first two ecumenical councils but not the third, which took place in Ephesus in 431 and condemned Nestorian Christology that this church, in fact, had adopted. Today, the church is centered in Iraq, where it faces a very difficult, if not catastrophic, situation, but the patriarch, Mardinka IV, lives in Chicago. The Assyrian Church of the East is not in full communion with any other church, so it's out there by itself sui generis. Well, our relations with the Assyrians took a dramatic turn in November of 1994 when Mar Dinka IV signed a common Christological declaration with Pope John Paul II in Rome. 
And this document says that today, Catholics and Assyrians are united in the confession of the same faith in the Son of God and set aside the Christological disputes of the past. The Declaration calls for broad pastoral cooperation between the two churches, especially in the areas of catechesis and priestly formation. It also established an official theological dialogue and charged it with overcoming the obstacles that still prevent full communion. And in the years following the Common Declaration, a warm relationship also developed between the Assyrian Church of the East and the Chaldean Catholic Church, its Catholic counterpart. And I think that this is, so far, it's, it's a unique situation where the Assyrians and Chaldeans, who come from the same tradition of the ancient Church of the East, uh, have begun to cooperate so much on many different programs, the formation of clergy, preparation of catechetical material. They even began to talk about what a reunited church would look like and the kind of structures it would have, the way it would relate to Rome and so on. It was a very interesting relationship that I think is unprecedented uh, elsewhere. In 2001, the Holy See officially recognized the validity of the anaphora of Adai and Mari, an ancient Eucharistic prayer used by the Assyrian church that does not have a coherent institution narrative. Uh, This was an extremely important development. In fact, Father Robert Taft says that this was probably the most important liturgical decision by the Holy See since the Second Vatican Council because it dealt with a whole series of issues and the fact that this Eucharistic prayer does not have a a coherent institution narrative and yet said that it should be considered valid. And also the Holy See approved sacramental sharing between these churches under some circumstances. Unfortunately, relations have been going through a challenging period following the decision of the Assyrian Holy Synod in 2005 to suspend Mar Bawai Soro, the bishop in California, who had long been in charge of ecumenical relations for that church. This was due mostly to some internal misunderstandings within the Holy Synod, as far as I can tell. Um, And then in May last year, Marbawai was received into the Chaldean Catholic Church, along with a handful of clergy and a number of faithful, um, and so, uh, in fact, did, did become a Chaldean Catholic. The two churches remain committed to building closer relations, but unfortunately, the theological dialogue, which had almost finalized an agreed statement on the sacraments, has not met now for five years, uh, in part because of Marbawai's situation. So this is an unfortunate development that's taken place recently in that relationship, but, and uh, so perhaps now the best way forward is simply to think about a time of reflection and healing. Um, I do feel certain that once a bit of time has gone by that this relationship will resume, and I think there's a lot of reason to be hopeful about this in the long run. So that's the Assyrian Church of the East, again, out there by itself, not in full communion with any other church. But the second group is considerably larger, and this is the largest group that resulted from the Christological disputes of the 5th century, known as the Oriental Orthodox Churches. And there are six of them, the Armenian, Coptic, Syrian, Ethiopian, Malankara, and Eritrean Orthodox Churches. Although they are in full communion with each other, each of these churches is fully independent and possesses many distinctive traditions. I like to say the Oriental Orthodox are a flat communion because this family of churches, as they refer to themselves, has no administrative center or any patriarch that claims even a symbolic primacy among them. There is simply no center to these six churches. And so uh, that makes it a very different kind of, uh, 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 a different group, a different kind of a group of churches to relate to. The common element among these churches is their rejection of the Christological teachings of the Council of Chalcedon, which took place in 451. It taught, of course, that Christ is one person in two natures, undivided and unconfused. They prefer the formula of St. Cyril of Alexandria, who, of course, is a great doctor of our churches as well, who spoke of the one incarnate nature of the Word of God. So it's a way, it's different ways of finessing that whole question of the divinity and the humanity of Christ 
traditional people of the Christian world who accepted Chalcedon talking about there being two natures, one human and one divine. But, uh, but St. Cyril of Alexandria and the Oriental Orthodox think of one nature that is both fully human and divine. But it's important to remember these churches have always rejected the classical monophysite position of Eutyches, who held that Christ's humanity was absorbed into his single divine nature. He used the image of the humanity of Christ being like a drop of water absorbed into the sea. There's really no humanity left in this kind of reality. But that has never been the position of these churches. Even so, these, these Christians have often been referred to erroneously as monophysites in the past. But relations between Catholics and Oriental Orthodox have improved enormously in the past 30 or 40 years. And this came about as the result of two things. One was an exchange of official visits between popes and heads of these churches, and usually an accompanying common declaration of some kind that was signed at the end of the visit, and semi-official meetings of theologians sponsored by the Pro Oriente Foundation in Vienna, Austria. The most substantial progress in our relationship has been in the area of Christology. The work of the first two Pro Oriente meetings laid the groundwork for a, historical com a, a, a historic common declaration signed by Pope Paul VI and Pope Shenouda III of the Coptic Church in 1973. Avoiding terminology that had been the source of disagreement in the past, the declaration made use of new language to express a common faith in Christ. And since that time, popes and patriarchs of these churches have repeatedly asserted that their faith in Christ is the same. In their 1984 Common Declaration, Pope John Paul II and the Syrian Patriarch Ignatius Zaka I Iwas stated that past schisms and divisions concerning the doctrine of the Incarnation in no way affect or touch the substance of their faith because the disputes arose from differences in terminology and culture. And so as a result of this, it can be safely said that the different Catholic and Oriental Orthodox Christological formulas are no longer a reason for division. And it's interesting to note here that there was no need to agree on a common formula. There was a recognition that the same faith was being expressed by means of different formulas properly understood. And I think that's a, a very important principle that can also have applications in other areas and other ecumenical dialogues. Progress has also been made in the area of ecclesiology. Both sides clearly recognize each other as churches, and there have been agreements on the mutual recognition of each other's sacraments. In their 1984 declaration, Pope John Paul and the Syrian Patriarch even authorized their faithful to receive the sacraments of penance, Eucharist, and the anointing of the sick in the other church when access to one of their own priests was morally or materially impossible. Until quite recently, when a similar agreement was reached with the Assyrian Church of the East, this was the only reciprocal agreement of this kind that we have with any other church. Here in the United States, these, there's been a national consultation with the Oriental Orthodox as a group since the 1970s. And this was the only example in the world of such a dialogue until quite recently when the Catholic Church and all the Oriental Orthodox churches agreed to establish a formal theological dialogue at the international level. Uh, there was kind of a feeling before that, and we've seen this in our American dialogue also, that these churches are very different from each other, and that's why it makes it difficult to relate to them as a single family. And until this time, the Vatican had direct bilateral dialogues with the, church, the Coptic Church in Egypt, uh, the Syrian Orthodox, and some of the others. But now there was a decision to create a new international dialogue to deal with them directly as a family. And this new dialogue held its first meeting in 2004 in Cairo and has met each year since that time. Just last January the dialogue produced its first major agreed statement entitled Nature, Constitution, and Mission of the Church. It treats some fundamental themes in ecclesiology, such as the relationship between the Trinity and the Church, the attributes of the Church, bishops and apostolic succession, synodality and primacies in the Church, and the Church's mission. 
The text also outlines a number of areas that need further study, and certainly I don't think anyone foresees that full communion will be restored anytime soon. Nevertheless, there's no question about the historic nature of this agreed statement. And personally, I think it's fair to say that in a certain sense, this is the first agreed statement between Catholics and Oriental Orthodox since the Council of Ephesus in 431. So it's been a very long time. I've been a member of this dialogue since the second meeting in 2005. And overall, I can attest to the fact that the atmosphere at these meetings is very friendly. I think much of this is due to our history and the fact that for the most part, we have not had a direct confrontation or break with them as we have had with the Eastern Orthodox. So on a gut level, there's more trust, more openness to listen to the other side. On a practical level here, the greatest difficulty we encounter in the dialogue is the fact that the Oriental Orthodox are indeed a very diverse group who sometimes do not know each other very well. So sometimes it's difficult for them to agree on a common position on the topics under consideration. In fact, not long ago, some voices in the Vatican were opposed to having a dialogue with them as a group because they have such widely divergent theological positions and practices. One example would be Oriental Orthodox attitudes towards Catholic baptism. The Armenian, Syrian, and Malankara Orthodox recognize Catholic baptism, but the churches in Africa, the Copts, Ethiopians, and Eritreans, receive Catholics into their churches through re-baptism. Now, for us, that's a very clear statement that they don't recognize our baptism, although some of the cops have assured us that just because we receive Catholics into our church through baptism doesn't mean we don't recognize your baptism. But this is something we need to, to, to thrash out a little bit and to clarify. It's just pastoral practice, you see. Um, another question has to do with mixed marriages. Uh, it's, it's permitted by the Armenian and Syrian and Malankara churches, but the churches in Africa, again, the Copts, Ethiopians, and Eritreans, do not bless mixed marriages at all under any circumstances in either church. Uh, and I can say personally, some of the most difficult pastoral situations I've ever run into is when a practicing Catholic and a practicing Copt want to get married. That is just about, imp it's impossible for that to happen and both of them remain in good standing in their church. It cannot happen, unfortunately. So there are these kinds of pastoral issues that come up. But again, it illustrates the very divergent practices in these different churches. And ironically, in many ways, this dialogue that they have with the Catholic Church has facilitated a dialogue among the Oriental Orthodox, helping them to achieve consensus on the issue at hand. In fact, there's now a practice that when the international dialogue meets at the end of January each year, the Oriental Orthodox come a day early, not only to discuss the things they're going to be discussing with us, but also to discuss their own issues. And they've been actually authorized by their holy synods to do this. And so it's become a way to facilitate communion among these six churches of the Oriental Orthodox family. So overall, I would say this dialogue is very promising. And this relationship has already made a big contribution to the ecumenical movement by providing an example of how past disagreements over verbal formulas can be overcome. This was done not by one side capitulating to the other, but by moving beyond the words to the faith that those words are intended to express. And it's quite clear that Catholics and Oriental Orthodox today agree that by means of different words and different concepts, they express the same faith in Jesus Christ. And so now let's move on to the, by far, the largest group of Eastern Christians, the dialogue with the Orthodox Church. Again, sometimes referred to as Eastern Orthodox as a way of distinguishing them from the Oriental Orthodox. I always like to point out this only works in English because in other languages, it's all due to the results of the Battle of Hastings in 1066, and we've got this nice romance overlay on our Anglo-Saxon base. And so we have two words, Oriental and Eastern, that mean exactly the same thing, but we can arbitrarily as assign them to these two groups of churches to make these kinds of neat distinctions. In French or Italian, you can't do it. And so dealing with the Orthodox Church, the... The origins of the international dialogue can be traced back to the warming of relations that took place between the two churches in the 1960s. 
From the Catholic perspective, the convocation of the Second Vatican Council, at which Orthodox observers played a significant role behind the scenes, indicated a greater appreciation of Orthodoxy. There's a positive evaluation of the Orthodox in the Council documents, including a favorable assessment of their many legitimate traditions that diverge from Latin practice, and an unqualified recognition of the validity of Orthodox sacraments. And from the Orthodox perspective, the third Pan-Orthodox Conference on Rhodes in 1964 encouraged the local Orthodox churches to engage in studies preparing for an eventual dialogue with the Catholic Church. But at this stage, everybody realized that before any fruitful theological dialogue could take place, there would have to be an increase in confidence and trust between Catholics and Orthodox. There was a consensus that, you know, if you get together and you start talking about the filioque and papal primacy, all you're going to have is a big fight. But first, there had to be this dialogue of charity, as it was called. And it was marked by historic encounters and symbolic gestures that began in January 1964 with the meeting between Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athenagoras of Constantinople in Jerusalem. This was the first time a pope and ecumenical patriarch had met for centuries. In a common declaration issued by them simultaneously in Rome in Istanbul on the 7th of December 1965, the mutual excommunications of 1054 were lifted and, as the document says, erased from the memory of the church. And so, class, as I always like to say, if someone asks you about the excommunications of 1054, the proper answer is, what excommunications? I never heard of it. <laughs> Erased from the memory of the church. You remember nothing. And then in 1967, the Pope and Patriarch exchanged visits in Rome in Istanbul. Well, this more positive atmosphere made possible the establishment in 1976 of a joint commission to prepare for an official dialogue. And so in 1978, it submitted a, it submitted a document to the authorities of both churches in which it recommended that the goal of the dialogue be nothing less than the reestablishment of full communion. And it also proposed a methodology according to which the dialogue would concentrate first on the many areas that the two churches have in common, establishing a firm theological foundation with a new theological language that would enable them at a later stage to address effectively the more divisive issues. And the commission recommended that the sacraments be considered first, especially as they relate to ecclesiology. I think the wisdom of this recommendation will become clear as the dialogue unfolds because they got off track for a while, as we'll see in just a few moments. But certainly their recommendation was, again, you have to start with what you have in common. You have to build a foundation. You have to build a base. And when you have a fundamental understanding of these issues, then you can start to move on the basis of that towards the more, the more difficult issues of the past if they're going to be really dealt with effectively. That was their recommendation, and I think that the wisdom of that, again, has been borne out by history. Well, the official announcement of the beginning of the theological dialogue was made jointly by Pope John Paul II and Patriarch Demetrius I in Constantinople on the 30th of November, 1979. This new Joint International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church was to include bishops and theologians in equal numbers from both churches, the Orthodox side including representatives from all of the autocephalous and autonomous churches. The first plenary session took place in 1980 on the Greek islands of Patmos and Rhodes. It was highly symbolic that the very first session took place on the island of Patmos and of course St. John the Evangelist and Revelation and so on being very prominent there. And at this organizational meeting, they unanimously adopted the plan that was set forth in the 1978 document and chose initial themes for examination. Cardinal Johannes Villebrands, president of the Vatican Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity, and Archbishop Stelianos of Australia of the Ecumenical Patriarchate were named as co-presidents. 
Over the next eight years, the Commission met five more times and adopted three common documents on foundational theological themes in keeping with the methodology that was adopted. In Munich in 1982, the text entitled The Mystery of the Church and of the Eucharist in the Light of the Mystery of the Holy Trinity was adopted. Again, very fundamental themes in, in Trinitarian theology and the church. In Bari, Italy, a document called Faith, Sacraments, and the Unity of the Church was finalized in 1987. And at the Orthodox Monastery of Valamo, Finland in 1988, a third common document was adopted, which has a very long title. It is the Sacrament of Order in the Sacramental Structure of the Church, with particular reference to the importance of the apostolic succession for the sanctification and unity of the people of God. Repeat that for me, I'll give you a dollar. <laughs> but dealing with, again, things that we agree upon. There's really no major disagreements between us on the issue of the sacrament of holy orders, of deacons, priests, and bishops, and, and all of that. So again, the commission was building that foundation that had to be built first before more difficult things could be dealt with. At Valamo, it was agreed that the next area of study would be conciliarity and authority in the church, and a draft text on this topic was later prepared for the sixth plenary meeting, which was scheduled to be held in Freising, Germany, in June of 1990. During the two years before the Freising meeting, however, the unfolding of events prevented the commission from considering the text that would be prepared. The Valamo meeting took place on the eve of the 1989 uh, uh, collapse of communist governments in Eastern Europe. And this event, happy as it was, caused a major crisis in Catholic Orthodox relations because of the reemergence of Eastern Catholic churches in the region that had been suppressed by the communist governments. Ugly confrontations arose between Eastern Catholics and Orthodox over Eastern Catholic property that had been confiscated by the communist authorities decades earlier and given to the Orthodox. All this dovetailed with long-standing Orthodox grievances arising from the process leading to the creation of some of the Eastern Catholic churches, this process which the International Commission would refer to as uniatism. In view of what was happening in Eastern Europe, the Orthodox delegation at Freising insisted that the question of the origin and present status of the Eastern Catholic Churches be the only topic of discussion, and that the theological text that had been prepared be set aside. Under the circumstances, it was only possible to issue a brief statement at the end of the meeting, recognizing that the problem had to be dealt with urgently and calling for a full-scale study of the issue. This took place at the seventh plenary session in June of 1993, held at the Balamand Orthodox School of Theology in Lebanon. The Dialogue Commission adopted a common document uh, whose title was Uniatism, Method of Union in the Past and the Present Search for Full Communion. And I want to emphasize when the commission talks about uniatism, it's talking about a method. It's not talking about the existence of Eastern Catholic churches. Uh, I, this was not always understood properly, I think, sometimes, because there were impressions given that there were, it was commenting about the existence of the churches and not uh, a, a policy of the Catholic Church toward the Orthodox. The Balaman document hinges on two central affirmations. On one hand, the method which has been called uniatism is rejected because it is opposed to the common tradition of our churches, and on the other hand, it unequivocally affirms that the Eastern Catholic churches have the right to exist and to act in response to the spiritual needs of their faithful. It called upon Eastern Catholics to participate in the dialogue at all levels. And the document also rules out all forms of proselytism between Catholics and Orthodox, saying it's a waste of pastoral energy and affirms that salvation is available in either church. The Balaman document was the first attempt to deal with this extremely delicate question and therefore was a major step forward. Pope John Paul and Patriarch Bartholomew both uh, said that it was a step in the right direction, but on the local level, reactions were very mixed. In Greece, the Orthodox Church condemned the Balaman document and called for the abolition of the Eastern Catholic Churches as the only solution to the problem. In Romania, the document was approved by the Holy Synod of the Romanian Orthodox Church, 
but was rejected out of hand by the country's Greek Catholics. So exactly the opposite of what happened in Greece. It was only in Ukraine that Balaman gained support from both Eastern Catholics and Orthodox. In any case, the Orthodox side insisted that since there was no consensus about Balaman, the same topic would have to be treated in more depth before the commission could return to its theological agenda. And after many delays, the coordinating committee produced a draft text in 1998. The title was Ecclesiological and Canonical Implications of Uniatism. And the eighth plenary session was then scheduled to take place in uh, Emmitsburg, Maryland in 1999. But then came the NATO bombing of Serbia and the Orthodox were saying they couldn't meet in a country, in a NATO country that was attacking an Orthodox country. So it was delayed by another year. And finally, though, the session took place from July 9th to the 19th in the year 2000. Uh, actually, one evening during the dialogue at Emmitsburg, they invited the members of the North American Dialogue to come up to meet the delegates and, and to have dinner with them and so on. And the consensus was, it was ironic because exactly the same days, uh, President Clinton was meeting with uh, Yasser Arafat and the Israeli Prime Minister at Camp David, which is about 10 miles away. And just about everybody agreed that President Clinton had the easier task. <laughs> This is pretty tough. <laughs> but the only text that came out of the Emmitsburg meeting was a joint communique issued on July 19th. And it notes that the documents previously issued about uniatism had met with strong opposition in some quarters and that it had been necessary to make another attempt to reach agreement on this extremely thorny question, as they called it. And then came the key paragraph. The discussions of this plenary were far-reaching, intense, and thorough. They touched upon many theological and canonical questions connected with the existence and activities of the Eastern Catholic Churches. However, since agreement was not reached on the basic theological concept of uniatism, it was decided not to have a common statement at this time. For this reason, the members will report to their churches who will indicate how to overcome this obstacle for the peaceful continuation of the dialogue. So reading between the lines, basically they said, we just, we just couldn't do anything. And this draft text that they had was unacceptable. Um, apparently, it did want to say in some sense about how Eastern Catholics were in an, an unusual or abnormal ecclesiological situation and so on, but there was just no way to get a consensus about that. And so there was simply no possibility of moving forward. And so this resulted in what I like to call the Emmitsburg impasse. Uh, which would last for a full six years. And uh, it took a very long time for the dialogue to get restarted. In the meantime, there was a whole series of what I like to call confidence-building measures, of trying to, in, in essence, trying to rekindle the dialogue of charity uh, once again, because it had really kind of died out in a certain sense. And so there were a lot of things that happened in the following years. For example, Pope John Paul and some of the Orthodox patriarchs were, were calling for a resumption of the dialogue. The Pope returned the Kazan icon to the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, he returned the relics of St. John Chrysostom and Gregory Negri Nazianzen to the Ecumenical Patriarchate. A church in Rome was given over to the use of the Greek Orthodox community. Uh, the Pope's visit to Athens in 2001 was extremely important. There were exchanges of delegations between the Serbian and Bulgarian churches. So all these things were intended to increase the sense of trust between the two sides, which would enable then the dialogue to restart. And also on the Orthodox side, Patriarch Bartholomew uh, was advocating a resumption of the dialogue, and he sent out a delegation to visit all the Orthodox churches to talk about the conditions to get the whole thing restarted. And eventually there was an agreement that the question of uniatism is a question that cannot be resolved at this time we don't yet have the language, we don't yet have the theological foundations to do that. So it's an impossible situation. And so essentially it was agreed to put the question on the back burner for a while, but then to return to the theological agenda to build up that foundation in order to address that question at a later stage. And that really was what set the stage for a breakthrough in the dialogue. All this served as preparation for the ninth plenary session then, which finally took place in Belgrade, Serbia, in September of 2006. And this was a crucial turning point for a couple of reasons. 
First of all, the representation of the Orthodox churches was almost complete. Uh, it should be kept in mind that at Emmitsburg, the Orthodox churches of Jerusalem, Serbia, Bulgaria, Georgia, and the, and the Czech and Slovak republics were not represented. And also at Balamand, the Orthodox churches of Jerusalem, Serbia, Bulgaria, Georgia, Greece, and the Czech and Slovak republics were not there. You know, so you're talking about a serious lack of representation from the Orthodox. But by contrast, at Belgrade, all the autocephalous and autonomous churches were represented by two members each, except for the churches of Antioch and Finland, which sent one representative, and the Bulgarian Orthodox delegation, which was not present due to illness. But this is an almost complete representation of the Orthodox. And second, at Belgrade, the dialogue was able to overcome the Emmitsburg impasse and return to the theological agenda. The course of the dialogue since 1990 had revealed the wisdom of the original plan and shown that departure from that plan because of events in Eastern and Central Europe had led to a dead end. Indeed, the status of the Eastern Catholic churches cannot be resolved without first dealing with the theological questions that lie at the heart of the division between Catholics and Orthodox. Does the fact of their full communion with other churches throughout the world place any limitations on the independence of local or national churches? If there must be such limitations, what are they? What kind of authority, if any, must be held, at the local, uh, must be held by the local church that serves as the center of the universal communion in order for that church to fulfill its role? It's these kinds of questions that have to be dealt with before these other more difficult issues can be addressed. But the mere fact that the commission was able to return to the theological dialogue and to look at this document that had been gathering dust for 16 years was really a major breakthrough. Unfortunately, there wasn't time at Belgrade to finish the document, and there were some ominous signs in the public statements of Bishop Hilarion, uh, one of the Russian Orthodox members after the meeting. He expressed serious reservations about the draft text treatment of the role of the Patriarchate of Constantinople among the Orthodox churches and the methodology of the dialogue. And these comments foreshadowed a clash among the Orthodox that took place at the 10th plenary, which was held in Ravenna, Italy in October of 2007. Orthodox representation at Ravenna was still strong. The Bulgarians were absent again and also the Russians, but more about them in just a moment. The great accomplishment at Ravenna was that the dialogue was able to finish work on the draft that had been prepared for Freising. It was finalized on October 13th and released, and released to the public on November 15th, 2007. The full title of the Ravenna document is Ecclesiological and Canonical Consequences of the Sacramental Nature of the Church, Ecclesial Communion, Conciliarity, and Authority. Its main purpose is to reflect on how the institutional aspects of the church visibly express and serve the mystery of koinonia, of communion. It takes as its starting point the relationship between the one father and the other two hypostases within the Holy Trinity. And so it looks at the relationship of, between the one and the many at all levels of the church, local, regional, and universal. In each case, it's a matter of the one primate and the authority he must have in order to ensure unity among the many. This was a challenge both to Catholics, who have tended to downplay the importance of the, of the regional level of authority, and to the Orthodox, who have downplayed the universal level. But perhaps the most significant section of the document is where it treats the relationship between the one and the many at the universal level. Their conclusions regarding the primacy of Rome is found in two paragraphs, and I think they merit reading in full. Number 43. Primacy and conciliarity are mutually independent, are mutually interdependent, excuse me. That is why primacy at the different levels of the life of the church, local, regional, and universal, must always be considered in the context of conciliarity and conciliarity likewise in the context of primacy. Concerning primacy at the different levels, we wish to affirm the following points. One, primacy at all levels is a practice firmly grounded in the canonical tradition of the church. Two, 
while the fact of primacy at the universal level is accepted by both East and West. There are differences of understanding with regard to the manner in which it is to be exercised and also with regard to its scriptural and theological foundations. 44. In the history of the East and of the West, at least until the ninth century, a series of prerogatives was recognized always in the context of conciliarity according to the conditions of the times for the protos or the kephale at each of the established ecclesiastical levels. Locally, for the bishop as protos of his diocese with regard to his presbyters and people. Regionally, for the protos of each metropolis with regard to the bishops of his province and for the protos of each of the five patriarchates with regard to the metropolitans of each circumscription. And universally, for the bishop of Rome as protos among the patriarchs. This distinction of levels does not diminish the sacramental equality of every bishop or the Catholicity of each local church. Well, as you can imagine, these conclusions caused a bit of a stir in some quarters. Uh, For instance, the Romanian Orthodox Church felt the need to post a notice on their website saying that no, the Orthodox did not accept Roman primacy at Ravenna. It's not quite so simple as that. But all the same, um, it is a major accomplishment. And as Monsignor Paul McPartland, a Catholic member of the dialogue, has observed, agreement on the Ravenna document was like setting up base camp at the foot of Mount Everest. We still got a long way to go. But important as it was, however, the status of the Ravenna document among the Orthodox has been compromised by the decision of the Russian Orthodox delegation to walk out of the meeting at Ravenna almost as soon as it began, and the Moscow Patriarchate's subsequent criticism of the text. The problem in Ravenna was that there was a representation for the first time uh, from the Autonomous Church of Estonia under the jurisdiction of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. This gets into a very complex issue in the Orthodox world about the Uh, ability of the Patriarchate of Constantinople to establish these kinds of jurisdictions and Moscow's claim to have a a certain canonical territory uh, in which uh, they would say the Patriarchate of Constantinople uh, intruded. Um, The history is very complex. Estonia, of course, was basically a Protestant country at a certain time when it was annexed to the Russian Empire. An Orthodox community began there. It was uh, within the Russian Orthodox Church at that time. But then when Estonia became independent in 1918, because the Russian Orthodox Church was under Bolshevik persecution, they asked the Patriarchate of Constantinople to take them under its wing. And so they did that and became an autonomous church under Constantinople. Then at the end of World War II, Estonia was annexed into the Soviet Union and the church then became a part of the Russian Orthodox Church again. And then after Estonian independence once again in 1991, Uh, there was a segment of the Orthodox in the country that asked to return to Constantinople's jurisdiction. This was not a unanimous request. The community in Estonia was divided. This led to a very difficult time and uh, negotiations between Moscow and Constantinople that eventually agreed to sanction the presence of two jurisdictions on the same territory, Uh, one autonomous church under Constantinople, actually quite a bit smaller, and uh, an Orthodox diocese as part of the Moscow Patriarchate. But nevertheless, the Moscow Patriarchate has never recognized the legitimacy of that autonomous church in Estonia. And so when they came to Ravenna and found a delegation from the Estonian autonomous church under Constantinople, and, they, and Constantinople refused to uh, take back the invitation, the Russians walked out. So uh, that's one piece of this puzzle that still is not entirely clear. And the Russians, again, have been rather critical of the Ravenna text. They were not there to approve it, and they're going to make their own evaluation of it. Um, But uh, that's something that may, there may be some uh, movement on this question because there are reports, which I've not seen official uh, confirmation of this, but there are reports that Moscow and Constantinople have agreed that from now on only the autocephalous churches will participate in the dialogue. So that would mean no Estonians, but also no Finns. They've been, they've been participating since the beginning. But this would be one way to resolve that problem so that hopefully the Russians would be able to attend. 
Uh, the dialogue, in fact, there is a, the next stage, uh, a draft text has been produced uh, for consideration at the next plenary, which will be held in Cyprus this coming October. And the topic that was set for the next phase is the role of the Bishop of Rome in the church, the Pope in the church, in the first millennium. Now, that will be very interesting because rivers of ink have been spilt on this question, and Orthodox and Catholics over the years have both appealed to that tradition to support their own, their own positions. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how a common reading of the history might lead to a greater agreement, at least on the historical facts and the way the Pope uh, functioned in the church at that time. So that, I think, is basically where things stand. Um, so what conclusions can we draw from all of this? First and foremost, in spite of some difficulties with the Assyrians, which again I think will, uh, are just a matter of time until they'll be resolved, we live in a very hopeful period for Catholic Orthodox relations. The dialogue with the Oriental Orthodox has made very good progress and the dialogue with Eastern Orthodox has made a major breakthrough and is once again moving forward. All of this illustrates once again how extremely important it is to keep talking to one another, especially during times when there are misunderstandings. As Pope John Paul II recalled in his 1995 encyclical Ut Unum Sint, it is necessary to pass from antagonism and conflict to a situation where each party recognizes the other as a partner. When undertaking dialogue, each side must presuppose in the other a desire for reconciliation, for unity in truth. For this to happen, any display of mutual opposition must disappear. Only thus will dialogue help to overcome division and lead us closer to unity. I think this is precisely what has been happening between Catholics and Orthodox in recent months. But it's precisely full communion that remains the holy grail of the Orthodox Catholic dialogue. No one knows when that day will come, but clearly there is light on the horizon, and we must remain hopeful that the Lord's will for us will be fulfilled. As Pope Benedict XVI and Patriarch Bartholomew put it so well in their common declaration of November 2006, the Holy Spirit will help us to prepare the great day of the reestablishment of full unity whenever and however God wills it, then we shall truly be able to rejoice and be glad. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Ron, for this vast sweep, this panorama of the ecumenical situation and your encouragement to us to keep talking. It's one of the reasons we're here tonight, and we hope that questions will be asked to allow us to keep talking, and then also in the gathering afterwards, in the reception, it allows us all to keep talking with each other and listening and hopefully furthering that dialogue of which you spoke. And so now, Father Ron will take questions from the audience. Thank you. Were there any Greek Catholic churches represented at any of these um, dialogue meetings? Yes. I mean, that's been there from the beginning. There's. Uh, in fact, in the very earliest stages of the international dialogue, there was a period when the Orthodox requested that there be no Eastern Catholics on the Catholic side. Um, but this led to, I mean, the Catholics were very firm that one of the principles of ecumenical dialogue is that each side is completely free to put together their own delegation. That, that's, 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 the Orthodox are absolutely free to have whomever they wish on their side, and we're absolutely free to have whomever we wish on our side. And so from the very first, uh, very first session of the dialogue, there have been Eastern Catholics involved. Um, and, I, and at least for a while, there was also a Maronite, but there have been Greek Catholics involved. Um, the issue which I have heard expressed at different times is these are individuals who were appointed by the Holy See. And that's the methodology that's used in all the dialogues, whether it's with Anglicans or, or Reformed or Lutherans or whoever. 
And I know some of the Eastern Catholics have requested that their churches appoint individuals to represent them. And that's a different kind of question. But certainly, uh, Eastern, Catholic, Eastern Catholics have been part of the Catholic delegation all along. Father Ron, a great talk, by the way. It's nice to see you. It's been <laughs> eons. I, I knew him in Rome. <laughs> yes. You were very instrumental in us having a really good time in Constantinople the first time. Anyways, Father, um, you mentioned two developments uh, uh, briefly in passing almost uh, that I would like to ask you about. One is the, uh, the use of the mutual language of calling each, each side calling each other churches. And the other is the um, occasional limited, inter permitted intercommunion between groups. Uh, on the face of them, they, they sound real great. My question is, do you find that it's possible, or have you found that at all happening, that such um, progress may be actually allowing people to not progress any further. By that I mean, since we're now churches and since we now do some communion stuff, it's kind of, we're all okay and we don't really need to move any further than we have and we can be real comfortable with all calling each other brother and sister and, and that's as far as we need to go. Well, it's an interesting question. I know that many times the lack of ability to do that can be an incentive to dialogue, certainly. My, my own experience when I was in the seminary at St. Paul's College in Washington, D.C., during those years we had an agreement with the Lutheran Seminary in Gettysburg that any of their male students who wanted to study in Washington for a while in the consortium could live at our place. And uh, so we had a group of, oh, probably a half dozen Lutherans there when I, when I was there in formation. They would usually come to Eucharist with us and they'd be with us for the Liturgy of the Word, and then we'd go down for the Liturgy of the Eucharist at the end of, other end of the chapel, and when it came time for communion, they would all leave and go back to their, their, their pews, and that hurt. But it's precisely the hurt that motivated the dialogue, we have to do something about this. Um, and there is a sense, I think, in which if there's sacramental sharing that's unrestricted, um, it, can, it can diminish that and sort of say, as you say, I mean, what's the point of an ecumenical dialogue? Um, though I'd also reflect an interesting uh, anecdote I remember hearing. Uh, I, I was for four years at the Council for Christian Unity in the Vatican, and so participated four times in the sending of a Vatican delegation to Constantinople for the Feast of St. Andrew, as, as is the tradition. And I remember once being part of that delegation in Istanbul and in the back of a car with uh, the Apostolic Nuncio to Turkey on my left, and Bishop Pierre Dupre, who was number two at the Council for Christian Unity on my right. And the nuncio was saying to Bishop Dupre, he said, why don't you do something? All this has been going on for so long, all these dialogues and stuff, you know, well, why don't you do something concrete? And so on. And Bishop Dupre's response was very interesting. He said, you know, the 1984 declaration between the Pope and the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch reestablished the status quo ante, if you will, before the schism of the fifth century. Uh, if Syrian Orthodox are in the West, they can come to our churches. If our people are in their areas, they can go to their, their churches. He said, that's all we need to do. It reestablished the situation of the fifth century. Certainly, Rome was not at that time exercising any sort of direct jurisdiction over those churches, and uh, that that was what full communion meant at that time. Now, I'm not sure too many people would agree that's, that the dialogue is finished at this point with these churches, but it does illustrate the dilemma of uh, how you, when you become closer, um, how do you intensify or keep going the momentum towards dialogue to resolve the remaining issues? And it's a bit of a dilemma, I would say. Uh, Father Paul Suda, St. Alexander's Orthodox uh, Church in uh, Allison Park. Uh, I want to follow up on Father's uh, question because I thought it was very interesting, primarily because I think what happens is the Orthodox would look upon, of course, the ecumenical movement as being one of a great thing. Uh, however, we do, of course, believe that the sharing of the Eucharist should be the last stack and not the starting point. And, and I, think, I think a lot of times that's very difficult because, for example, if I go to a hospital on a Sunday morning and take communion to one of my parishioners and there's a, a Roman Catholic right next door and, and uh, 
he'll say, well, can I have communion? And I'll say, well, let me go to the desk and see if I can uh, uh, find out if there's a Eucharistic minister or a priest coming around uh, this morning to, to offer it to you. I said, if you were dying, I said, under those circumstances, uh, we would, uh, uh, of course, we're all dying, but I mean, if you were dying immediately, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> what would happen? And I, and I think what happens is you made a good point. If we have 50 differences and we sit down and we leave the table with 45 differences, we're actually much closer than the sharing of the Eucharist, even though it may not give the impression that that's the case. And, uh, and, and, and internally, we Orthodox have our own problems. Uh, uh, Rome, I think, has reached out far more than we are able to, primarily because you indicated the conflict that exists between the Ecumenical Patriarch and the, and the Church of Russia. And uh, it, hasn't gotten, it hasn't gone away. In fact, it's probably accelerated even a little bit. And when you look at orthodoxy, if we have 250 million, uh, you know, uh, Mark Twain said, collect the facts, we can distort them later. So I don't exactly know how many we really have. But, uh, uh, but in any case, I think what happens is if there's 50 million Orthodox that are represented by the Russian Orthodox Church and they're excluded in many instances, it's a substantial, it's the largest Orthodox community in, in the Orthodox world. And we have to find a way to kind of uh, get everybody on board and that's the difficulty. The other thing is you indicated that the, you solved the problem, but you haven't really solved the problem. When, you, when the Orthodox churches are gonna be uh, at the next gathering, there will be the autocephalous churches there. Well, for example, I belong to the Orthodox Church in America, which is listed as the 15th Orthodox autocephalous church in the world, except Constantinople said, well, nice try. Uh, you didn't quite make it in our book, so I don't know if the Russians will stand up to that and walk out, or whether or not they will say, well, you know, you're, you're a little small yet, we'll let you grow a little bit. Took a couple hundred years for Constantinople to recognize the autocephaly of the Russian church. So we have our own internal problems, which actually complicates uh, substantially any kind of ecumenical dialogue, as, as you pointed out. And I think I rambled enough, so I'll let you uh, give a few <laughs> remarks. Thank you. I'll just make a couple of comments. One is that, I mean, as it's been pointed out, there, there was an agreement early on in the dialogue that the absence of any particular church would not scuttle the dialogue. If somebody chooses not to be there, fine, that's their choice, but the dialogue will continue. But as it's been pointed out, the Russian Orthodox Church is not just another Orthodox Church. It's half the Orthodox world right there. And personally, I think that any dialogue with the Orthodox when the Russians are not at the table is a waste of time. Because if, they are, they're, not, if they're not on board. Otherwise, um, some of the other questions you were dealing with, I mean, one of the principles of ecumenical dialogue is, and certainly in this one, the Catholic Church recognizes and respects the canonical structures of the Orthodox Church. So in terms of Constantinople's role and Russia's place and all of this and everything, that is totally for you guys to work out. And all, all we can do is, you know, pray that you'll work it out. <laughs> you know, but this is something... Well, you know, if it takes that long, it takes that long. <laughs> but that's a very cardinal principle, you know, that it's, uh, you know, something that you guys have to resolve and, and we pray that it will be resolved so that everybody can be at the table. Thank you for a very interesting talk this evening, Father. Uh, I was very interested in how you laid out the uh, foundations of the three different dialogues and what methodologies seem to be working in them. For those of us who are in this great area, you say, as we all live together, mm -hmm. uh, what, method, what of those methodologies or what other methodologies do you think would be applicable to us at a local level uh, in dealing with our fellow theologians, pastors, and educators? Well, at a local level, I think there's lots of things that can happen, but it depends a whole lot on the, the makeup of the local community, kind of the relative presence of different communities and different traditions. Um, you know, there's a lot of parts of the United States, for example, where the dialogues with the Eastern churches just are off radar because there's not enough of them out there in those regions. So I think there's a lot that can be done in an area like Pittsburgh where there's a substantial Eastern presence in these kinds of issues than maybe in, in many other places. Um, I think there's a wide variety of choices. I mean, I think certainly the, the wisdom of the methodology that the Commission suggested for the international dialogue is very clear. Um, 
you know, whether that would need to be followed in the same way locally, I think would be up to local people to decide. I think there'd be possibilities of studying the documents of the dialogues. I think those are really important. Some of them are kind of heavy going. Um, it'd be very important to be aware of the texts that have already been agreed to and also the texts of those common declarations. I think those could be taken, you know, take a common declaration and have an evening discussion about it. They're not very long sort of thing. Just to kind of understand better perhaps the exact uh, uh, state of our relationship. But also there's all sorts of historical questions. There's individual issues, papal primacy, filioque, whatever it might be and so on that might be good to read about and to understand better. And to, uh, and to do what you can to just improve general understanding um, and uh, charity between the various groups. You know, historically, um, history has shown after the Council of Florence, after the Second Council of Lyons, if you can get all the bishops together and the theologians and they can thrash out all these questions and they can sign on the dotted line, but that doesn't mean it's going to stick. And in both cases, it didn't because the people were not ready for it. So, uh, you know... You guys out there, you know, have got to be part of this, and it's something that has to take place at all levels of the church, because otherwise there's not going to be the kind of reconciliation that we're hoping for. So um, I would strongly encourage those kinds of things at the local level as much as possible. Um, I have a, a question regarding our, our own internal struggles within the, the Catholic Church. Um, we have some concerns among different people about how how our structures work. Um, I think we could especially look towards the, the Ukrainian church, um, major archiepiscopal status, you know, how we look at major archbishops and, and their roles and such, and um, the push within the Ukrainian community for a patriarchal status within the church. Um, how do you see those impacting our dialogue with our Orthodox counterparts? This is an example of the kind of issue, actually, as John Paul pointed out, where because of our ecumenical relationships, um, we just can't make decisions anymore as though other churches didn't exist. And the fact is our relationship with the Orthodox is real. It's something we want to, to, to foster and to overcome the divisions and so on. And it's a simple fact that the Orthodox have been very clear that if the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church were raised to patriarchal status, um, there'd be very serious repercussions in our relationship. I think the Catholic Church, well, first of all, I think there's no church that deserves it more than the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, absolutely, because of its history, its faithfulness to, uh, to the Catholic Church and, the, and the, the suffering and the martyrdom that it underwent. There's no other examples of that as vivid and as clear. And I think there's every reason in the world to, to, to raise it to patriarchal status. Um, on the other hand, being a patriarchal church is almost, it's about 99% symbolic in terms of the, real, the way the church functions and the real change it would make in the daily life of Ukrainian Greek Catholics. It's just about zero. So the question is, how great a value is that and how great a value is relations with the Orthodox and trying to balance those things. So far, the Holy See has decided that relations with the Orthodox um, trumps the issue of the Patriarchate. That's a, that's a decision that they have made. But it's not an easy decision, I can guarantee you. And uh, it's just one of those things that, you know, that we have to deal with these days and uh, what the repercussions of our actions will be outside of our own church. You can tell I like microphones. Uh, on a, on a follow-up on that, it's kind of interesting because basically what happens in, in dialogue that goes back and what happens with, uh, with the issue that you're just talking about, it, it, it seems to me that whoever was in charge at a specific period in history and time just had the opportunity to persecute the other. And, I, and hopefully that, that, that eventually will have to stop in order for us to have some kind of Christian love. We, we call ourselves Christians, but in many instances, if, if the Ukrainian Catholics were in charge or any, any, anybody else in charge or the Orthodox were in charge, the other ones were suppressed. And then when the other one got in charge, they said, well, it's payback time. This happened with the Serbs and the Croatians. And, and I mean, it's, it happens in Ireland where you have the Irish Catholic and the Protestant Catholic. And, and what happens is it's very difficult to overcome all these years of history uh, without actually trying to enlarge our Christian heart. And I think basically you, you gave a very good answer. I think what happens is 
it, th there's a scale in everything, and the scale is, if this is going to cause and, and inflict more pain, is it worth the pain? And, and then the other thing is that, is, is somebody being deprived of something simply because we want to appease somebody else? It's a tough call, but that's what the ecumenical is move, movement is all about. It's about concessions and about looking at someone else's need and trying to kind of like make, make a sacrifice internally. And if both sides don't make the sacrifice, we're the same. We're not going to go anywhere. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and it took a Catholic. Great points to conclude with. <laughs> Once again, Father Ronald, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture and the additional enlightening comments from the various questions. <laughs>